Colorado, we have a problem. Ah! Smart bears are outsmarting foolish humans. The new numbers today, they're wild. The threat of demolition blindsides a popular restaurant. This might just be a real estate game, though. A trip to northern Colorado to trace a source of the population boom. Why are so many of our airport's escalators so often just sad, stationary stairs? And I'll ask a billionaire running for president if a billionaire could single-handedly hold off climate change. Honestly, Kyle, I think that's a terrible idea. Terrible ideas coming your way on Next. I'll say this, Colorado. It's a good thing that bears mean us no harm because we are doing a lousy job keeping bears at bay. Think of all the advantages that we humans have. Superior technology, opposable thumbs, pants, and yet bears are quite literally eating our lunch in Colorado. 5,300 incidents last year. We asked our Steve Steger for just the facts. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The music has been slightly altered to avoid copyright infringement. Previously, there was multiple reporting forums on our bear conflicts. Finally, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is tracking bear uh, crime, or uh, bear conflicts. Freaking bear. In 2019, the agency counted 5,300 interactions with bears. A third of them were bears digging through the trash, but quite a few of them were a bit more sinister. The number of bears that got into, you know, homes, garages, cabins, and also bears that broke into vehicles. This data reads a bit like a police crime report. And in this case, much like actual crime prevention. Go away, bear. Bear crime prevention can save lives. These other numbers, it shows the pattern and the progression that leads to an unnecessary death of a bear. What starts with trash can lead to break-ins, which in turn leads CPW to have to euthanize a bear because they're too comfortable with people. Of the 5,000 interactions reported last year, only 92 bears were euthanized, 1.7%. But CPW is hoping to get that number down. And since you can't change nature, they are hoping to use these numbers to change the only thing they can. Humans. Um, I can't go because there is a bear behind me. Keep your trash inside. And if you're in a space where you need to keep your windows open, perhaps you should consider building one of these scary looking bear unwelcome mats. Only you can stop a bear from a life of crime. CPW says the biggest bear crime areas are Aspen, Colorado Springs, and Boulder. It's really difficult to compare last year to previous years because CPW didn't have an all-encompassing way to track all of this stuff. They basically had several regions throughout the state where they would all keep data, but they never really put it all together. They didn't have a standard for how they track reports, and so now all of it is in one place they yep. can, and they can use this data. I imagine it's got to be frustrating for them because a lot of people who have been in Colorado for a long time understand what we need to do to be bear safe, but constantly new people are coming in. They don't take it quite as seriously. So education has got to be so ongoing, right? The thought is with this data, you can use it. You can have a meeting with like an HOA or yeah. a town and say, this is what we need to do to make sure bears are safe and in turn we are safe. I should bring those mug shots that you use. Those are very sure. effective, Thank I you. thought. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. RTD's new leader knows he is not going to last long. Paul Ballard's job is to just keep things from going off the rails, transit pun, for 4 to 14 months while RTD finds a permanent boss. Ballard told us today he is focused on getting the end line open, working on employee retention, and regaining public trust in public transit. The first step, Ballard admits, is admitting there's a problem. Obviously, if people feel there's a crisis, for them it is a crisis, and so therefore it becomes, a, we have to recognize that and respect that and, um, and treat it appropriately. But we, the only way we can get the public's confidence back is to do what we say we're going to do. Now, if we say we're going to do certain things and we don't, that would be a serious problem. Ballard does not like the idea of cutting service due to staffing issues any more than RTD does, but Ballard didn't have a better idea at least not on his second day on the job. The sign posted on the door of the Saucy Noodle only listed one thing on the menu, demolition. That was a total surprise to the woman who owns that restaurant in Denver and her customers. Now, despite the scary red lettering on the sign, it is not a demolition notice. It is a notice 
the, the building's owner has applied for what's called a certificate of demolition eligibility. Does not mean that it will definitely be torn down, but the future's kind of up in the air. The restaurant's been renting the space for more than 55 years. The lease is up in December. What we've learned is that filing for one of these can give a property owner options, especially if they're looking to sell. Often it happens when they are looking to sell the building and because having the certificate in hand would mean that the buyer knows what they can and can't do on the property. Um, and sometimes it, they just want to keep their options open in terms of redevelopment or renovations, things like that. Anybody in Denver could fight that application and argue that the building, Saucy Noodle, is a landmark worth preserving. The owner of the Saucy Noodle tells us it's not going to be her. She'd rather just finish out the lease and take the restaurant someplace else. Michael Bloomberg's entrance into the Democratic presidential primary has made Tom Steyer into the billionaire that progressives like. Steyer is showing some appeal with non-white voters, and he's expanding his message beyond climate change, which has always been his top priority. We began our one-on-one -on -one discussion talking about the air pollution on Colorado's Front Range. As far as I'm concerned, when we talk about air pollution, we talk about asthma. What we're really talking about is getting rid of the transportation-based air pollution. It's something that we deal with in my home state of California a lot. I've worked really hard to replace diesel truck engines and also school diesel school bus engines. I just finished David Wells' book, The Uninhabitable Earth. I'm guessing you're familiar with it. It looks at the impacts of climate change and some possible solutions. I and have. Uh, there's a theory that we could at least buy ourselves some time by putting suspended particles into the air to block sunlight. And that's something that we're not likely to get global consensus on. It would change the look of our skies. The book suggests that an environmentally conscious billionaire might just go rogue and do it without permission. What do you think of that idea? Honestly, Kyle, I think that's a terrible idea. You know something? You know what I believe in? I believe in government. I believe in the American people. I think if we're going to solve this problem, we're going to solve it together. And so I think something like that, which could have unintended consequences of vast proportion, I don't really think that that's a great idea for somebody to go out and change everybody's life without their permission or acceptance. That's why I'm running for president. Because, in fact, the way that we can do this in a democratic way is to come together and decide to do it and do the right thing together. That's the American way. Do you think that future Americans should have the same pathway you did to amass a fortune and choose to keep it if they wish? Look, I don't think we should put a ceiling on the ambitions of Americans. I do think I would change the tax structure dramatically and start to charge people fairly who are rich people in big corporations. Yes, I would have a wealth tax, Kyle, just so you know. I proposed that for over a year and a half. What we've seen is a concentration of income and wealth in this country that is wrong, it's un-American, it's unjust, and I would work to a, against it as fast as possible. But I would not say to people to put a ceiling on their ambitions. Tom Steyer used to support fracking. And I asked him how he came to change his mind. You can see that in our full unedited interview on the next YouTube channel. That's where you'll find my discussions with Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator Amy Klobuchar, Tulsi Gabbard, and former Mayor Pete Buttigieg. We extended invitations to all of the major Democratic candidates, as well as President Trump, head of Colorado's primary next Tuesday. Take a drive north up I-25 and you will see houses sprouting out of farm fields. It's not just the cheaper land and the open space fueling the population boom. It is also the economy driven by people looking for a college degree. Our Mark Salinger reports from Fort Collins. On a cold winter day in Fort Collins, the sound of money keeps the ovens hot at Pizza Casbah. If it wasn't for CSU being across the street, we wouldn't have gotten where we're at today, pretty much. The restaurant near Colorado State University Probably credits the students the for keeping them open 20 years. We do dollar slices every Monday and Tuesday. It's just one business that's benefited from the nearly $4 billion impact the four colleges and universities in northern Colorado have had on the economy. The city and the town have grown up together, and through that time, CSU has contributed significantly to the economy. Between CSU, 
University of Northern Colorado, Ames Community College, and Front Range Community College, a new report released Tuesday shows one in eight jobs in Northern Colorado are supported by higher education. Students, when they graduate, are staying and working in the region. As exciting as a room full of economists and college presidents is. It's great to have you all with us this afternoon. Let's go back outside to see where the money is spent. The study shows the four colleges and universities added $1.1 billion in income to Larimer and Weld counties in 2017 and 2018. All that construction that you see all around these college campuses, that totaled up to $126 million that same year. And spending by students totaled up to $148 million in one year. You know, we hear about oil and gas, we hear about agriculture, but education is such a vital part of the economic vitality. Of so when it comes to growth in Colorado, it's not just housing and development driving the boom. It's also the books, the jobs, and yes, all that pizza and beer that students buy. College students live and die for pizza. For next, I'm Mark Salinger. One in eight jobs there, they say, they say are linked to the colleges and universities. So I am thrilled to announce tonight that Nine News has an exciting new way for you to share your contempt for next. You can now text us your criticism. 303-871-1491 is the number. Text us and let us have it. Go ahead, just unload on us like you do on social media or email. But the new text function, it buzzes my phone personally. So I'm forced to look at each and every incoming message. Like this one. So glad you have this option now so that I can text every time Kyle Clark ruins the news. He is the worst. Seriously, he's unwatchable. I've started changing news channels. Again, the number to text is 303-871-1491. I do have to warn you, the system lets me text you back. The comedian Mitch Hedberg used to joke that an escalator can never break. It can only become stairs. DIA has a lot of stairs. A robot bus goes rogue. And that means federal investigators are shutting down the one in Colorado. And a guy creating community with poetry. Well, it brings people together. All this generic uh, McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, they're not learning anything from that. I know you're probably saying, is it only Tuesday with another round of snow and wind? But yes, and once the system rolls out tonight, you are going to love the weather pattern. Today, our high only 30. Temperatures held in the 20s for much of the day. Winds, which have topped 60 miles per hour out near Lyman, creating whiteout conditions and blizzard conditions east of Akron and Ray down to Parker and Elizabeth. 
Finally, the winds are easing, coming in out of the north as this low pulls away. The wind and snow decreasing. The winter weather advisory scaled back to 7 p.m. for areas like Burlington. Here along the front range, some leftover snow showers, but the trend is for less snow as skies clear. The winds let up. Good radiational cooling. We're going to have a real cold night tonight with overnight low temperatures in the single digits and our wind chill in Denver down to about minus 8. So we'll call it clearing and cold with less wind that low at 6 tomorrow. A cold star a warmer day, low 40s, and then check this out. We've got 50s for Friday, close to 60 Saturday and Sunday. Chance for snow Monday into Tuesday. That storm does not look significant or overly cold, and it is a new month, so perhaps it's a new weather pattern. In the meantime, you can get up into some of this great, oh, the powder is going to be amazing, Kyle, for skiing and snowboarding. Thank you, Kathy. Those driverless buses seem like a great idea until you hear about the braking problems. Um, Basically, it's Frank Costanza's stop short and grab. We witnessed it when we rode one of those things near DIA last year. Now, a serious injury on a bus that abruptly stopped in Utah has federal regulators taking him off the roads. This poor guy, Utah State employee, fell when the bus abruptly stopped for no reason. The only one of the autonomous buses being used in Colorado right now was in Golden on the NREL campus. They received notice today they had to take that shuttle out of rotation. They said they did it. They told us they didn't have any kind of braking issues with the one that they've been using since August. They're now shuttling humans the old fashioned way with other humans. Our next question has come in over the years from a ton of you. Mike, Betsy, Jack, Kyle, Raymond, Garrett, Asa, Patty, Carey all wanted to know why the escalators at DIA always seem to be broken. Our Marshall Zellinger has had to climb that escalator staircase a time or two himself, so he set out to find the answer. Thanks to you, we have no shortage of pictures and videos of out-of-service escalators and moving walkways at DIA. I see it so often out here. Jim Leary is a DIA regular. I probably take 20 to 25 flights a year. He's also the father of former Next producer Carrie Leary, and he's been taking photos of broken escalators and walkways since at least 2016. It's a black eye to this city to this airport and to our state. We like the feedback. We like the fact that our community is engaged with us. We like real-time notifications. DIA has a standard. Any escalator, moving walkway, or elevator can only be down 15 minutes a day or no more than 7 hours and 45 minutes a month and still be considered okay. Last year alone, on average, an escalator went out 18 times at some point during the day. Nearly 11 moving walkway outages each day and five elevators. Would you believe the stat that Usually they're back up within half an hour. Statistics are like a drunken man on a lamppost. They can be used for illumination, but not for support. On any given day, you may see an escalator out of service somewhere in your journey, but for the most part, they're up and operational 24 hours a day for 25 years now. At DIA for Next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. Tonight, our Corey Reppenhagen combines three of his favorite things, wild weather, a long scarf, and poetry and a series of new art installations in Lakewood could use that kind of energy. It's whimsical, it's colorful, it's bright and impactful. It's basically empty. Next.
There's this mailbox on Colfax. Tall, colorful, bright, and what's inside is for you. Our Tom Cole grabbed his camera and went to take a look. Oh, the things you see on Colfax. It's whimsical, it's colorful, it's bright and impactful. It's as if a page from a Dr. Seuss book came to life in Lakewood. I'm a writer, so I find this to be a very interesting piece here in Denver. Hi, I'm uh, Peter Missing. I'm a uh, musician artist from New York City. Missing found this mailbox to his liking. I just moved to Lakewood and I'm checking out the area and I came across this interesting piece of artwork here about dropping off a poem and picking up a poem. It does kind of stand out. I call it urban folk art. That's my opinion of this because it's, um, you know, it's got the colors from the 60s. It's got the rainbow. There's a lot of meaning going on in here. And there's some hope there will be words going in here. It's intended to be fun and lighthearted. Liz Black represents 40 West Art District. They're all about making West Colfax funky and engaging. The idea behind it is that you could write and leave a piece of poetry, or you could take a piece of poetry, put it in your pocket, and take it home with you. This is the only piece here in Denver that deals with poetry in the open with no money exchange, and you get to share your ideas. It's quite, quite phenomenal. There are six poetry mailboxes along the 40 West Art Line, which is literally a four-mile green strip on the sidewalk, leading to all things art on West Colfax. Is it working? Okay, there is actually a little piece of poetry in here. It says the author's name is Peter Missing, and the poem reads, easy to be negative, hard to be positive. Special thanks to all the artists who made this. It cheered me up today. For next, I'm Tom Cole. Corey Reppenhagen is on the weather beat. Five degree wind chill with frostbite on the prairie. Snow squalls are trendy. Woo! That was Corey Reppenhagen on the weather beat.
All of your feedback tonight comes via text to our new text line 303-871-1491. Hey Kyle, Chris in Lakewood is somebody who's not on Twitter or Facebook. I'm excited I can now comment. Thank you. Somebody else writes, this is a seriously bad idea. People are mean. And then this, dear Kyle, I hate your guts. Love, Rachel. See you next time.